Thanks for joining in this session. Today we're going to discuss about Terraform for Azure. So this is the first of a series of three webinars that we're going to discuss around automation of your infrastructure with Terraform. So today we're going to lay the fundamentals of Terraform for Azure. How do you get started? The fundamentals of the language, the fundamental of the tool set that you're going to use. But stay tuned for the other episodes going very deep down on the wonderful things that you can achieve with Terraform. So let's just get started and let's set the scenes first. We are going to talk in this session about DevOps. And it's always a three-stage conversation. It's always about people, processes in the company, and tools. This is a technical session. We're going to focus almost exclusively around the tools in this series of events. So first question is doing infrastructure as code with Terraform. What is it all about? What does it look like? Well, it is first important to understand that infrastructure as code is important for organization because when you do that, you are very capable of managing reproducible environment. What I mean by that is you can very easily describe an environment that is going to be dev and test, then it's going to be QA, then it's going to be production. So there was always in IT this difficulty of how do you make sure that production, QA, and dev and test have some kind of similarities. That's really one way that you can do that greatly with infra as code. Is like since everything is written as code, then you just validate the code into different environments, and you can then do release packages all based on code. So there's no more mistake of missing one step in the procedure, missing one step in the script. It's just all infra as code, so there's no mistake possible. It's really a great step that you can achieve towards DevOps when you can have all those elements on your infrastructure that are inside a CI CD uh, pipeline into continuous integration and continuous deployment in your environment. It's very easily trackable. When your infra is described in code, you can very clearly see the change as it has happened inside the environment. There's no more discussion on who has clicked where and what has happened. It is just written in the code, and the statement of what a change looked like is just there in line. So Terraform is very interesting for that because it brings really a language called HCL, HashiCorp language, that brings a way to describe resources that you're going to deploy in your environment. So it's a declarative type of um, coding. You just say what you want to do, and that's just Terraform's job to translate from their language to the language of Azure, which is ARM. So it's very easy to um, play with this language. You have this famous uh, workflow in four steps that we're going to see in just a couple of minutes. And we have a rich set of providers that are here to help you deploy resources in every possible solutions that you can find in the IT world. So that's what Terraform allows you to do. Terraform does not allow you to deploy configuration that are the same across all clouds. That's a very common misconception about Terraform that I really want to clear today. It's like, yes, there is a common language that you would use to describe deployment of resources across different clouds, across different technologies, and this is called HCL language. But every cloud provider, every provider, technology and solution provider, has their own specifics. So there's not such a thing as write code once and then deploy it to different platforms, different technology. This is not a Rosetta Stone of deployment. That's really something I wanted to highlight before uh, we get started, because that's an important misconception that we see quite a lot. So after all, why are people loving Terraform? Well, first, as I mentioned, HCL. I think it's really um, something that we can recognize. You can easily write code, you can easily maintain the code, it's rather clean, it's not too much of a parenthesis, hyphens, a square bracket, bracket, parenthesis, it's very easy to, to manipulate. It's a declarative type of configuration, so you don't have to worry about the dependency, you don't have to worry about writing explicitly all the procedures and all the statements. You just ask Terraform what you want to do, and then it's his job to enforce that inside your environment. Automatically, it will manage the dependencies for you. So when you create a resource, it will manage an implicit sense of dependencies. And when you destroy resources, it will also manage the way back from this chain of dependencies. 
We also love it because it's, full, it's uh, allowing you to do version control on the infrastructure. So easily, you can track the changes that has happened. And ultimately, this language, uh, the HCL, and the whole ecosystem of skilled person that have written codes for uh, Terraform, it's really reusable. Even though each provider has its specificities, there's still the way of writing the codes, which is very well recognized around the ecosystem. What are the caveats now of, uh, of Terraform that we see and the pushback that we see sometimes? is like sometimes when we release a feature and we are in the early release of a feature on Azure, then for instance, the provider for Terraform is not ready. And that's something that we hear often as a pushback. The great thing is that you can still with Terraform complement and extend that part waiting for an official Terraform module to be ready. Then you can extend the language, you can use that and deploy, for instance, some bits of the infrastructure relying on JSON template and ARM template extension. So all of the advantages of Terraform should not be outweighed by the fact that, yes, sometimes the features are taking a little bit more time than the cloud pace to deploy this feature via Terraform. So that's always a balance. There's no perfect tool set. There's always this discussion around, is this inconvenient? Uh, worse and outweighing all the other advantages that we see out of it. So as we see, we see the whole ecosystem. So it's Azure, it's Azure Active Directory, but also you can describe a deployment, including the deployment of your Kubernetes uh, environment, the, the deployment of your F5, deployment of your Cisco Palo Alto, because they all have rich provider. And you can basically write a configuration that describes all the things from the cloud control plane and up to the deep down configuration of the big IP, for instance, uh, security rules. So that's a very powerful and very comprehensive approach. So here we go. Let's get started with our first uh, language of, uh, with our first element of language and architecture of Terraform, which is the Azure provider. So there's an Azure RM provider, as you see uh, on the screen. That's how you uh, call uh, it, and then uh, you will rely on authentication. So authentication to use your subscription with Terraform can come in the first of Azure CLI, so you basically inheriting the authentication context out of your shell. You can also leverage it via service principle or via Azure managed identities. So then that's uh, system identity and Azure ID identity that will be running the code uh, that you're providing uh, Terraform with. So that's the way uh, you call the Azure RM uh, provider and the um, arguments that you can put it for it to be ready to talk to your subscription. Another very important aspect of Terraform is the description of the data sources and the resources. So in Terraform language, resources is a very important aspect. It's just basically the description of what you're trying to deploy. So if we look at an element of Azure resources and data sources, as you can see on the screen here, I'm calling the provider Azure RM. So here you see I'm not using any argument inside the uh, parentheses because I'm just relying on the current authentication context. And you can see that then I'm calling a resource called Azure RM resource group called network. So as you see on this first line, I'm creating an object which is a resource group in Azure RM and the internal name of the object inside Terraform is called network. And the fully qualified name of this resource will be then in this context be Azure RM resource group dot network. And then you see name equal production and location equal West US. But you can see that the name of the resource group as I create it inside my Azure subscription would be production and it will be running into West US data center. Then you can see if you go down inside uh, the, the, this little bit of a script, you see that I'm creating an Azure RM virtual network. So that's the network. Here I use the name network uh, here. And the name inside the Azure subscription is going to be production dash network. Then you can see that I here specify the address space for it, the location. And here you see that I'm calling it out as a variable. So remember, previously I create a resource group which is called network. So you can see that here I reuse an in location of this virtual network. I reuse the location of the resource group because I'm calling Azure RM underscore resource group 
dot network, so that's my resource group object, and then I put dot location. That's the attribute of the resource group I just specified before. And then basically you see that I can leverage this kind of variable across modules. And here I specified a subnet uh, and a set of subnets that I could use. So here I create subnet one, two, and three. And same thing, I could be declarative into that, or I can use a variable that I put into another uh, data structure that I can put, for instance, in my variable files. We're going to see that in a minute. But importantly here, let's do a little break and see at this code. We are able to provide any of the fundamentals of Azure with that, which is compute, storage, network. You see uh, Azure Active Directory, you see database, you see the monitoring elements, and of course the storage storage account with the different types of storage account, but also we have providers for platform as a service. So any other things like container, uh, web applications environment, ASE, Cosmos DB, data lakes, Logic Apps, and Key Vault, all of those elements, same thing. You can leverage them, create them the same exact way using uh, HCL language. And as you mentioned, there is also a catch-all option, which is sometimes when you don't have a specific provider for something you're trying to achieve, well, you can still chain it an ARM template where you use the JSON uh, syntax that is a little bit more complicated, some would say. I would say it's a little bit different, but that can allow you to extend the Terraform capability to a module that might not be existing right now when a service, for instance, is in preview in Azure. So how do you leverage uh, Terraform inside your environment? Well, this is a great set of efforts that we've been doing. So right now, out of the box, you have Cloud Shell. So you know Cloud Shell is this shell environment that you can bring up within your Azure console on your Azure portal at any time. And Terraform is included there already. So if you just go there and type Terraform, you can see and you can run your Terraform environment from there. Probably you want to have a nice UI to edit your Terraform code. No problem, we have that with Visual Studio Code. That's my favorite environment to deploy my Terraform scripting. You have syntax checking extensions that allow you to verify that the syntax is actually correct in Terraform world. And then you can directly out of Visual Studio, well, launch it with the Terraform extension or just use it in whichever way you use to store your templates inside Azure. So let's do a little bit of an overview of here, the tool set. Terraform in Cloud Shell, Terraform on my machine with Visual Studio. All right, code. so in this first demo, let's set up our environment for doing Terraform on our laptop. So I'm here on terraform.io. I can download for those different platforms. You see, I'm going to start with it on Windows X64. Uh, so I've downloaded it, put it in my path, and I'm running now 12.6 on my laptop. I can also go on shell.azure.com. That's where I can have a hosted shell within Azure. I define the storage for that, and you see that we have built-in Terraform, which is present, and you can leverage here. We have version 12.5, which is present there. And you can even have a nice environment for edition, which is basically code. So you have a minimal version of Visual Studio Code that you can use directly from there, and you have a dual window where you can run your code and edit at the same time. I still prefer Visual Studio Code on my laptop because I still have uh, all the edit uh, features. So now I'm creating um, a directory here. I'm going to put my main.tf file and you see that as I change it, I have uh, the color coding of my extension and I have the extension installed. So now I can have autocomplete uh, for my environment. So let's do a first test out of that, and we're going to have our main.tf. We're going to just put provider uh, for Azure RM, and we're going to create our first set of resources and edit here. So you can have the Terraform Hub to get started with some code. So you have the install and configure the platform. And you can see that first for the authentication, I can use either uh, Azure AD service principles, uh, that I can create here and I can get the name for the variables that I need to use, uh, like the subscription ID, client ID, tenant ID, and secret. Or I can rather just reuse the current Azure CLI authentication context, which I'm going to do here. So here I'm going to copy paste uh, just a bit of code with the creation of a resource group, 
we see here that I'm running Azure RM Resource Group and I'm creating something called My Resource Group. That's the Terraform name. And the technical name deployed on Azure would be Test Resource Group inside the West US region. So now I can have my uh, terminal uh, down. I can look on the further uh, samples that I have here and I can add just copy uh, and paste the code for creating my first virtual network. So I copy uh, just the code from here, another resource. So resource is the fundamental aspect of Terraform where I'm going to deploy something. If we zoom in a little bit, we're going to see that inside this uh, code, I have uh, my resource group and my virtual network. They are not yet together. So I have my VNet deployed in East US while my resource group is in West US. So let's do something. First, for the resource group name, I'm going to reuse the variable Azure RM resource group dot. And here you see I don't have the right resource group. So I'm going to change it to my resource group. I'm going to paste that into the object name and I can add dot name for the name of the resource group. You can note that it's a very dot 11 type of syntax, but that still works here. So I can use that and then for the location, I can do the same thing. I can inherit the location of my uh, resource group. That's it. Uh, that's what I have for my configuration of my environment. I can add uh, the tagging for the resource group so that I have a consistent uh, type of tagging for this environment. And I can say that I want it to be environment equal Terraform um, demo. So that's my uh, little environment. Let's do and execute that into the next demo. All right, now we're good to go. We have the right tool set on our laptop and we can deploy uh, Terraform resources. So let's get a little bit deeper inside the, the language and some of the fundamentals like variables. So the variables, basically, you can store them into a tfvars file that will be containing simply the key value pairs of the type of variable that you uh, want to use in your environment. So you can compose that. You can use uh, also the auto.tfvar files. So that will be the variables that are automatically filled when you run your Terraform environment. It will automatically consume anything called .auto.tfvar. That's an important element of the syntax. And when you're developing something, that's a good way to get fast and test fast environment. When you're doing probably more production related type of workload, you probably want to work with the tfvar files that you then put as an argument inside your Terraform execution. Then Terraform is all about um, basically calling uh, some functions. So with these functions, you can do basic string operations, basic math operation. You can do uh, count when you want to create a series of um, events, then you can count and iterate on this uh, counter. You can do uh, conditional testing. So for instance, you say this var.environment equal uh, production. Then I put this variable var.env equal var um, prod subnet. Otherwise, the value is var.dev subnet. So that's the way you would write conditions in, uh, in Terraform regular language. And you have functions like CIDR, for instance, that allows you to create uh, subnetworks uh, based on a network address. So you just mentioned the number of bits that you want to be meaningful for the network mask. And then it will automatically create for you the subnets that you want to create. So those are some of the functions. And there's many more, of course, that you can leverage. Also, some of the things that you're leveraging in Terraform syntax is the provisioners. So you can have local exec provisioner that's basically running a script locally on where is Terraform running. So you want to run some bash uh, script, you want to run something out of Azure CLI, that's the way you're going to do that. Remote exec, well, as the name says, you want to ask some code to be run remotely on a remote host. And you can use file as a provisioner of data and import data out of a file. So workflow in Terraform, well, if you've done Terraform previously, you know those four steps. If you haven't, very soon you will get used to first thing, which is init. So you run Terraform 
in it. And when you do that, well, Terraform is going to look at all the files in the current directory, looking at all the modules that you're calling. So if you're, for instance, running Azure RM module, then it's going to download the Azure RM uh, module from, uh, from the web, from Terraform. And if you're running different modules that you wrote or that you're reusing from someone else, then same thing, during the init phase, it's going to download that for you. So it has a local cache of that executable or those templates. Next thing that we do is plan. So we're asking Terraform here to look at the file, look at the variables that you have, and check at what it is going to do. So it's the first step to verify that the syntax is well, and then that the sense of the information is working correctly. So you check that the resource group has the right name, you check that you have the right path of dependency on applying the resources. Then you call apply. Basically, you say, well, you know what, the file that I have here, just make that happen inside my Azure environment. So what Terraform is going to do is going to look at what we call the state. We're going to see that in a while. And it's going to tell you, well, based on what I've seen and the script that I have here locally, I need to apply those changes. And maybe it's the full script, or maybe there's some components I already deployed, so I'm not going to run the full code again. I'm just going to change the delta out of it. And the last step is destroy. And this is really this workflow that you're going to use all the time, every time, one way and the other. When you're writing code with Terraform, you really want to do a lot of this. Apply, destroy, destroy, revalidate that everything works, verifying any time that you're able to create a resource, verify that you are able to destroy it. That's a very good um, important element that you want to focus on. If there's any point at the destroy time, it means that your code is bad and you need to change the way it is written, you need to change the way you're calling variables, you need to change the nesting of your functions because when it's gonna, la when it's gonna hit production, it means that things can go havoc and haywire and you don't know how it's gonna end up. So that's a very good and important advice. Always apply, destroy, validate that it works correctly. That's the workflow, and that's pretty easy. Let's look at that at work in our environment here. So as we mentioned previously, Terraform workflow is in four easy steps. So let's take our code here, and we're going to say Terraform init. So that's the first step that we take all the time. And you see here that it's downloaded the Azure RM provider, since I don't have it cached locally. So it goes on Terraform and gets this uh, provider. So now I'm going to run a Terraform plan and I'm going to ask Terraform to enumerate what it is going to do with this script. So here it's rather easy. I have a resource group and a network. So that's what it's going to do for me. Next step is Terraform apply. So Terraform apply is going to show me what it is going to do when it's going to ask me for a confirmation. So here I can do yes and see that all those objects will come into life inside my subscription. So I can go back there and check at the object. So my resource group and the vignette is here created, my vignette. So that's pretty much about it. Now let's see if we can add something. So I can go on the terraforms.io website. I can see for the Azure provider and we can see that we have data sources or we have uh, resources. Right now we are going to look at resources because we want to add and deploy some more stuff inside my Azure subscription. So let's browse at the network uh, part of it and we are going to deploy some more stuff inside my network. So let's pick, for instance, uh, the network security group here. We're going to create an empty uh, network security group just for the sake of uh, the demo and see what we can do with it. So I'm just going to add that at the end of my script, I'm going to create an Azure RM security group called test. That's again, the internal name within Terraform. The public name of this NSG would be acceptance test security group one. So that's how it's going to appear in my subscription. So I just save my file, specify to reuse the location and the name of the resource group, and we're going to see that Terraform is just applying the delta, so just adding this object to my current configuration. And I can see that in my subscription. If I refresh, I see the NSG that has appeared uh, yet. So let's do a little bit more advanced stuff now and start playing with the variable. So when I play with the variable, I want to reuse basically uh, the 
definition or the settings and not re-entering it at every part of my resources that I'm going to deploy. So here I can put a description of this variable, I can put a default value. So if I don't specify any value in my code, then automatically the location that will be picked would be uh, Southeast Asia. Then I can put some other variable. Here I'm going to put a variable for the resource group name and I'm going to add a short description to know um, that actually I'm going to describe the name of the resource group to be created. And then I can add also some constraint on the type. So here I'm going to say for this type, I just want a string as a type for this uh, resource group as a name. And I can now replace in my code and I say use var.location and use var.resourcegroup name in my code. Now I need to define somewhere to define those variables. So it could be either a tfvar file, or if I want our form to automatically apply the values for me, I can just create an auto.tfvar. So anytime there's a file ending, dash, ending with .auto.tfvar, Terraform will automatically add, interpolate those values for me. So now I've created East Asia and Arno RG for the description. So you see that here I'm just applying uh, the changes and Terraform is going to destroy the object that are not matching that and recreate it uh, for me with the right parameter. So now I'm doing a little bit of change in my uh, code. I'm going to reuse the tags uh, everywhere as well. Uh, so var.tags for my uh, network. And oops, I forgot to add tags for the network security group. That's something I can do very easily here. And I need to define tags here. So same thing, a little description for what is a tag in my environment. And I need to specify a tag uh, structure. So here I'm using a map for this um, structure. So I can put environment equal Terraform demo and owner equal um, Arno. So that's a map of, of strings that I'm using here. So same thing, I'm saving all my files, I'm doing apply, and it shows me that it's going to create a set of objects uh, for me. So here I'm going to do yes, and I'm going to apply the configuration in my subscription. And if I go back here, I see that I have now my object created in East uh, Asia and my VNet that is created here. So if I do a Terraform uh, destroy, that's something I want to do to test if my set of resources I coded correctly. I can do Terraform destroy and I can do dash auto approve so that I don't want to be prompted for confirmation. Just delete everything right away uh, without my uh, further consent. Okay, so we're back. We modified our environment. As you mentioned, uh, when we do an apply of the configuration, it's not going to reapply the script at all the time because Terraform has an information of what we call the state of the configuration. And a state, you're going to compare, uh, every time you run Terraform, you're going to compare the state that you know about the infrastructure and what you have in the code. And as you mentioned, if something is already deployed inside Azure, you're not going to redeploy it uh, again. You're going to analyze the difference, and Terraform will automatically, for you, do only the change that is required to be, comfort to be uh, uh, confirming with what has been described inside the configuration and the resource that you're trying to deploy. So that's really an important aspect, the, the state. So by default, the state is stored um, locally inside uh, the environment. It's on your machine when you run Terraform. You may have seen that you have the Terraform state and you have the Terraform state backup. You can look at it. It will show you basically the output of the modules that you wrote, the output of the execution of the environment, and it will show you the different variables, the different knowledge it has about what has been deployed inside your environment. Now what you want to do is basically when you want to run Terraform at scale is you want to have the state stored somewhere else. Somewhere that is shared amongst multiple users because ultimately changes are not going to happen only on your developer workstations. Things are going to change and come from many different sources. So the way you manage that is via using uh, Terraform state, which is stored in a shared location. And this shared location can be in a different ways. It can be uh, in Terraform Enterprise. It can be in Azure uh, storage. 
So you can uh, basically create a blob storage inside Azure and say, well, you know what, store the Azure Terraform state on this uh, particular uh, storage. And then when you call uh, Terraform on the next iteration, you're going to tell them that, hey, you know what, don't use the local storage, use the backend Azure RM, which is on this storage account. So you give this guy basically the information. Here you can see on the back end the TF vars. You can see that you have the storage account, the container name. So the container name is the blob uh, container where you store the, the, the name. Here you see key. It's actually the name of the file as it's going to be inside the container of Azure Blob Storage. And you can see the access key, which is the access key to your storage account. You can all you also just use the um, resource group information here so that it avoids you to specify access uh, uh, keys inside the information. So let's have a look on how the state looks like inside the next demo. Okay, so let's play a little bit further with Terraform and we're going to start by creating some outputs to our uh, set of resources. So the outputs basically allows you to export some variables, some objects to uh, the Terraform state that you can then reuse and leverage in some other context. So here I'm going to set three output variables for the three things that I created inside this script, which is basically a network security group, a VNet, and a resource group. So I'm going to create them uh, as such as I have here the resource and then by the name of the object. So the resource is called Azure RM resource group dot uh, my resource group. So same thing for the other object. My uh, basically virtual network is called Azure RM virtual network dot Terraform my Terraform network. So here I could export some attribute of it, but I just want to export the whole object so that I don't have to worry about what's there. So if I save and if I do Terraform apply, then basically I will have now in the output the value that's going to be showed to me and then I can reuse that directly inside the Terraform state. So you see I'm running the script and you see that at the end I've seen all those outputs that have been uh, exported for me. So I have this available. But when we mean the Terraform state, uh, what is it exactly? So you may have noticed that here you have a file called Terraform state where you have exactly what we just mentioned, the outputs. So all those objects that are created, they are actually available in my Terraform state for me to reuse in, for instance, some other module. So that's kind of the public part of my Terraform state. Uh, there's kind of a private part, which I don't want to touch, I don't want to mess with, and I don't have access to it. Um, it's basically those uh, set of resources. So here, that's just a description of whatever I deployed. So we can see that we have a Terraform state which can be local. We can also have a Terraform state which is stored remotely. And that's very important. When you have an enterprise grade type of deployment, you can deploy your Terraform state onto Azure itself so that you can have a shared utilization of it and a lock. So when someone is using it, then you cannot make modification of it. So those are the different ways to uh, access to the remote state. I'm creating a remote state.tf here, and I'm putting some parameters. I'm setting that I want to use the backend on Azure RM. That's the name of my storage account. That's the name of my container inside the storage account. And here you can see that I'm going to use a file called tfstat demo webinar, which is now empty. And I'm going to do a Terraform init. That's important. I need to initialize the backend. Here, these guys see that this backend has not been remote uh, yet. It's still locally. So it's asking me if I want to export it. And I say yes. And you can see that if I now go back to my storage explorer, I'm able to see that the TF state is now stored remotely. So I have migrated my Terraform state. And if I see the local one, it's now uh, empty. I have the backup, which is still there. I can delete those files. I don't need them as it's now on my storage account. So if I do a Terraform apply, you see that now it's going to read the state uh, remotely. And if I do a destroy, same thing is going to be those operations and managing my Terraform state remotely without any issue. So you see that what I'm doing this operation, there's a lock on it. So no one else can uh, modify uh, the lock and do some operations 
with this uh, Terraform state right now. All right, so we've done all the basics of Terraform right now. We've created some resources, we've deployed them, we see how the state is maintained. Now let's have a higher level of abstraction. This higher level of abstraction is achieved via modules. So what is a module? Basically, you'll find yourself that sometimes you are describing an architecture and you are describing a deployment and you're going to have 10 times something called resource Azure RM virtual network. So wouldn't it be great if you can write this code once and then reuse this code everywhere? Because what happens if you're going to change some features in your network? Maybe you want to have it propagated everywhere or maybe you want to have the network to be requiring the same set of parameters all the time because sometimes you might write network and here you're just writing the code fast and you just say okay I want a network with this name this subnet but then you forgot to put the tags well you can write just a module the module would require you to basically provide all of these settings so it's a very good way to factorizing your, uh, your code inside your, your environment. So let's think about a module as an abstraction method, a container to deploy resources all the way the same, depending on different parts of your, of your code, of your repository. This has the counterpart that you have to be very careful when you write a module because when you write a module, what tells you that the module that you're writing right now that is fitting your needs is going to fit the need of another team creating a, a resource, creating a virtual network, for instance. So write the right level of maturity of a module. Where to use a module? That's an important question and learning that actually you will create in your organization as you use Terraform. There's no definitive answer for that. The definite true about that, the definitive truth about that, is really make it run in your environment. At first, maybe don't write modules, just write the declarative way. And as you're writing multiple times the same declarations, maybe you can factorize that using modules. And then you will see that your module makes sense. Your module is really highly reusable, highly um, um, scalable. And with modules, more than any kind of resources, be very careful. Terraform, init, apply, destroy. Destroy, recreate, apply, destroy again, change one variable. Check back, modify one variable. Check back that you're able to reapply. Check back how the change is applied in the environment. Check back that the chain of dependencies is resolved correctly. And if you're not able to destroy a resource you created via a module, your module is not ready to hit the road. That's a really important aspect of writing module is with great power comes great responsibilities. So let's now have a little play around some modules that we wrote for this uh, demonstration. Okay, let's have a little fun with the module. So now we're gonna try to refactor my code and create the network security groups via a module. So we're just gonna create here a local module where I'm gonna put my files inside the slash NSG directory. So I'm gonna create here the way to call this module. So I'm gonna pass him uh, the name of the module. I'm gonna change the variables to be a little bit more Terraform 12 type of syntax. I'm having uh, that field, uh, okay. I just now need to take the resource code and create that into my main.tf under the slash NSG directory. So let's do that here. I'm creating NSG directory. I'm gonna create a main.tf to get started. And of course, I'm not going to call the things directly. I need to change it to um, variables. So let's put uh, var.name for this guy, var.location and var.rg uh, for this guy. So that's just variables that are meaningful within uh, this module and we need to declare them. So let's create now a variable.tf file where I'm going to create all of those guys. So that's about it, variable.tf. I'm passing those four uh, variables that I'm going to inherit basically on the 
runtime when I call the module. Let's now modify the output. So my output for NSG is not anymore on the main module, but is now on the child module NSG. So I need to do the output and create same thing, the Azure RM Network Security Group .test, and I want to export um, that. So I will have this available uh, for me. So I have this, now I should be able to leverage uh, this as a module. So let's save all the files that I have here and let's have a quick overview of whatever thing I may have missed. So it's important to do a Terraform in it because we have a new module and we need Terraform to have the module logic in its cache. So let's do some check and we see that, yep, here I missed from my module NSG, it's called RG. So I need to feed the RG variable and not anymore the resource group name. So here, that's how I do the plumbing. I'm doing the Terraform apply and it should now be okay to apply this configuration inside my environment. So that's a very quick uh, refactoring uh, that I did on my code. Here you see that the output of the child object doesn't show up into the parent object. But I can share that and I could need I could re-export it with the output file if I export the child module. That's for the first one. We could also reuse some shared module that someone wrote previously. So we have the Terraform registry and you can also have any kind of module that you can leverage. So here I'm using my repository of uh, code that I have on GitHub and I'm going to use something to create the resource group, which is rather different. So here I have this resource group module that allows me to create not only a resource group, but a set of resource group out of a map of names that I pass to it. So here I'm going to see that same thing, this variable are accepted by this uh, module. So if you go there, I'm going to say my resource group set, and I'm going to specify that the code is basically coming from GitHub. So I'm going to copy uh, the link. I'm going to specify that I want a specific version that I see on the repo, which is the version 0 0.1. So rev equal uh, 0 0.1. And then I need to modify uh, here the URI to specify git uh, slash colon colon github.com uh, and as tf mode. So now I need to specify the parameters for um, calling this module. And we see uh, inside the documentation of this module that I take a prefix, which is going to be used for creating the resources. It takes a resource group list and it takes the location and the tags. So let's remove my previous resource group um, object. And you see that, okay, it looks pretty okay. I need to declare a variable called RG list. So I'm gonna keep resource group name for now. I'm going to create RG list. Now I need to populate this RG list. And I see in the documentation of the module that actually it's a map that I can create with a list, so i creating rg1 equal my rg1 and rg2 equal my rg2. So that's the data structure that I have and automatically by passing it to this guy is going to create those two uh, resource group automatically for me. So if I go back at the code, I see that in the variable, that's correct, that's a map of string that I pass to this guy. And I can see that inside the main, I'm gonna reuse this structure and I'm gonna use the element of it to create the resource group. So it looks pretty okay. Now I need to change the way that I'm going to create my resource group names inside my uh, virtual network and my NSG. So if I look at the syntax, I can now call this with module dot the name of the module that I created and then one name of one of the outputs that I'm using. So I see in my code that I have names, which is an output generated by this module. So I can use name, and name uh, actually is a map of strings that I can refer with the resource group one. So here I'm gonna check into the structure resource group one, that's where I'm going to reuse and I'm going to create the virtual network object. So I'm going to do the same thing for NSG 
And you see that here, that's my reference. So it's a zip with the list of the resource group and the name of the resource group. So that should do here. And let's just try this in my environment. So I saving all the parameters. I need to do an init because you see that this is now a new module which I need to download and put in my cache. So we downloaded it from GitHub. Now I have it locally. I can run the code and I can do my Terraform plan. So there's a bit of changes here. Let's see what I missed. So I missed that, yeah, my output is not anymore valid because I'm not directly calling uh, this object. I'm calling uh, RGList. So here you have the set of resources. It's not exactly a best practices. I should have destroyed it previously, but okay, it's resilient enough and it's going to do that for me. So if I do a Terraform apply with auto approve, it's going to delete the previously existing object and replace it with uh, the settings that I passed um, that I passed here. So that's pretty much the environment. I can do just a Terraform destroy and that's always a very good recommendation to do create, applying the settings, destroying, recreate it, changing one variable, then reapplying the settings, then destroying it. That's very, very important. When you're creating module, you're going to create things that you reuse everywhere. So you really want to test the robustness of uh, the code, the reliability and the deterministic behavior that you have when you're doing uh, the different step and the different life cycles of an object in Terraform. So that's it for the module. All right, so we've played now with the basics of Terraform. We've seen some modules um, at work. Um, have a quick introduction on the blueprints, which is a set of modules that are working together. It's very important if you want to go uh, deeper with Terraform, you can go to aka.ms slash tfhub, and that's actually the landing page where you can see all the resources that are related to leveraging uh, Terraform on uh, Microsoft Azure. Also, the definitive source of truth is uh, GitHub. So you have the GitHub repository for Terraform where you can see the Azure RM uh, provider and its latest changes. You can contribute to them. It's written in Go language. And also you can leverage um, basically Terraform.io with the different documentation of the production modules that we have uh, right now. As you mentioned, this was the first of a series of uh, webinars that we're running on deploying your environment with uh, Terraform. So up next, on the next session, we are going to see all we can do with Terraform, putting all of that at work. So all those things that we discuss, the modules, the blueprints, which are a set of modules that we put together. We're going to show you how, with our own field-engineered framework, you can deploy very easily a hub-and-spoke environment which is highly uh, compliant with best practices, Microsoft best practices, inspired by FSI environment, and how you can leverage that to very quickly, based on Terraform, deploy an environment which is enterprise-grade, hub-and-spoke topology inside a set of Azure subscription. So stay tuned for the next session. In the meantime, uh, if you have any questions, happy to take them into the chat box uh, here. And you can reach out to uh, me anytime, aka.ms slash Arno or at Arno Lereux. That's my Twitter. Thank you guys and see you soon.